slide show up for everyone. Uh, really excited this morning to, uh, for this academic year, have our first, um, what we sort of have coined, internal visiting professors. So uh, Dr. Mason is not a stranger to anyone here, but uh, we're really excited to uh, share um, you know, his knowledge with all, all of us today. Um, this was uh, something for those of you who are new to the program this year. Um, a couple of years ago when we were redesigning Grand Rounds, some of the residents were like, you know, we have all these amazing um, attendings who go elsewhere in the country and give these wonderful presentations that we hear about. Why can't we hear them too? So as our ongoing effort to highlight some of the work uh, and expertise of our, uh, of our own uh, professors, we have uh, Dr. Mason here with us to share um, today and we're uh, looking forward to this. Our CME color uh, is gonna be uh, green this morning. And we uh, look forward to uh, your talk about oh, things. Thank you. And, uh, I'm excited to be here and excited to uh, share with you uh, what I've uh, described as a anecdotes, myths, and heuristics, an ongoing story of tibial fixation. And this is a bit like close to Newcastle because some of the people that are, are, are actually uh, in the room uh, have been uh, helpful in, in this research. And now my I'm not, uh, let's see here. I'm not progressing. Down, down arrow. Down arrow. Space bar. I'm all. Space bar. Not working. Uh, I think I hit the. So just I uh, do have uh, uh, disclosures of which is pertinent that uh, some of the research support was from Duke you sent these and uh, I, I receive uh, intellectual uh, property royalties uh, from uh, Duke you sent these. As a point to start, an anecdote uh, is often uh, thought of as, as something less than uh, optimal in scientific circles because of the level of evidence. But an, an anecdote is actually derived from the Greek word unpublished or non-published. And I'd, I'd like to sort of stress with you, if I could, <clears throat> that virtually all science begins with, a, with an observation. So in order to create a theory, in order to be able to promote science, I think uh, we, we, we look first to, uh, to, uh, to anecdotes. In the first New York uh, Times bestseller book that, uh, that uh, Noah Harari wrote on Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, he actually took a bit of license in describing our evolution as a species it's a wonderful read, but in there he describes what, how we communicate uh, with one another and, and how we uh, transfer information. And much of that information transfer occurs in the, in the, in the form of story. And stories have been uh, categorized as basically myths. And you'd say, all right, in, 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 in science, uh, we discount myths and we want to sort of push away from myths, but myths are the single most powerful social consolidator for our entire species. Law, religion, politics, none of these are factually based, yet they provide order, structure, and community. And same, so, same goes to, true for myths and medicine. We use those to help us consolidate care for patients. It allow, allows us to kind of put information in a, in a succinct uh, sort of story to be able to transfer it from one individual to the next. Daniel Kahneman it was a, uh, is a, Nobel Prize winner in economics, but he was a sociologist first at Hebrew University and then at Stanford and Harvard. And he, he, pub, he, he came up, he coined the term heuristics. And heuristics are basically a, 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 a way of understanding what it is indeed that uh, how, how we make decisions. We assimilate information from multiple different directions uh, in, in our day-to-day -to, -day to be able to figure out whether to go after uh, the gazelle on the plane or whether we make a decision about how uh, to put a screw in here or there. But our, our ability to make those decisions is somewhat flawed. We're so self-confident in our uh, rationality that we think that our decisions are indeed well considered, but it's a Swiss cheese model, if you will. Our minds are riddled with biases that lead to poor decision-making and we often ignore data that we don't see and we weigh evidence inappropriately, particularly that uh, that we do see. And all three of these can, uh, can be useful in understanding the evolution of total knee arthroplasty. The modern era of total knee arthroplasty began in the early 70s. We had started with total hip arthroplasty in 1961 with John Charnley. 
And the FDA approved uh, uh, cement uh, in the United States in 1971, and there was a sort of this race to try to, to uh, create uh, total knee replacement and uh, stamp out the scourge of arthritis that we had done uh, recently well with early on uh, for total hip replacement. And it basically what uh, it came down to by the end of the decade was the consolidation of uh, essentially three different designs. And it, not that those are particularly important at this juncture, uh, but you, we saw this fail fast evolution, multiple uh, different designs were uh, wrongfully thought out from the mechanics. We had failures that would occur within months of uh, implantation. And it was, a, uh, it was a wild, wild west, if you will. By the time we got to the end of the decades, the learnings I tell you were profound. <clears throat> the condylar resurfacing we knew worked. The stability uh, we found was conveyed from both the soft tissue envelope as well as the implant design. We didn't need a hinge in there for every patient, but longevity was limited by loosening and wear failure mechanisms. And some of the antiseptic teachings from total hip arthroplasty were transferred to total knee arthroplasty, but the issues remain and actually were slightly uh, uh, higher uh, with, uh, with total knees. In the early 1980s, there was indeed this rapid consolidation of design. This was led by Condler uh, cemented designs and the debates at that time focused more on kinematics, uh, the cruciate, uh, cruciate uh, retaining versus cruciate uh, substituting uh, designs and technical aspects of execution, whether we we're looking at gap balancing or measured resection. And confluent with this was the story of polyethylene itself. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, until the early 1990s, the diseases that we thought uh, that were leading to wear of total knee and total hip replacements were thought to be cement disease. It wasn't until somebody looked at, uh, at these birefringent, uh, under uh, refractive microscopy, these birefringent crystals or particles that were inside the macrophages, they realized indeed that this was polyethylene that was causing a lot of this osteolytic uh, response. So <clears throat> back up just a bit before that discovery, and we were looking at some of these issues on the tibial side where you saw radial lucid lines beneath these all polyethylene trays. And we thought, okay, uh, brilliantly, if we can uh, 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 dis uh, disperse the forces beneath the tibial tray by putting a metal backing on there, we might actually move, the, uh, move, the, uh, move forward. That turned out in retrospect uh, to likely have been a mistake. We began to classify wear and delamination and uh, found conformity actually reduced uh, the unit stresses that increased implant stability and reduced this uh, delamination phenomenon that we were seeing. We also understood that there were influences from manufacturing uh, that led to uh, some of the uh, uh, problems that we were having with osteolysis. Direct compression molding, uh, lessons largely learned from the hip. Uh, performed better than machine bar stocked polyethylene and the locking mechanisms themselves were quite poor at first uh, and we were seeing uh, in, in the lab and in study on retrievals of up to 50x times higher wear rates on the underserved or backside of polyeth uh, polyethylene than on the articular side. Sterilization of the polyethylene also had a, a, a unique story. We were initially sterilizing polyethylene uh, in gamma and air environment. When you add energy <coughs> to uh, in air, it creates oxygen-free radicals. The oxygen-free radicals are embedded within the polyethylene. And we've started to see these banding within the polyethylene that uh, represented this oxidative uh, barrier. And it led to the development of gamma inert um, uh, sterilization. Well, gamma inert sterilization, again, energy added to a, uh, a polyethylene uh, chain led to cross-linking, improved the mechanical characteristics up to a point of the polyethylene. Interestingly, all of that had been discovered in other uh, in, in industry 10 years before, but not translated to medicine. But that, uh, and, and, and then from there, uh, we've uh, moved to uh, free radical stabilization. <clears throat> it's interesting to note that the window of observation for consequences and total joint arthroplasty and many other things that we do is often delayed. <laughs> this was a study uh, published by Tom Faring and, and, and Bill Griffin. It was a Coventry award-winning paper in 2004, and it basically outlined the factors that, uh, that led to osteolysis and wear and a, a particular uh, knee design. 
And it was landmark at the time because it, uh, it focused our attention on where all this osteolysis was actually coming from. And I would suggest to you that <coughs> complexity rarely yields a simple uh, answer. And unlike the 14th century uh, theorist uh, Occam with Occam's razor in which it's uh, the, the law of parsity or the least complex um, theorem is often the theorem uh, that, that wins. That may work in law, but it rarely works uh, when you're looking at complex systems <clears throat> that include design, kinematics, material, alignment, polyethylene, and patient factors like BMI and bone quality, all of which don't manifest their outcomes for some 10 to, 10, uh, 10 to 15 years in the future. So where we've been operating is essentially in this fog of war where uh, you're unable to see what's happening on the other side of the chest. But we're getting better. This is from uh, the AJRR, the American uh, Registry. And you can see the horizontal lines here are looking at uh, the uh, Kat uh, Katlamar estimates of cumulative revision by year uh, of knee replacement uh, plotted year by year. And there's a slight negative trend <clears throat> to those lines as you get uh, towards the uh, right-hand side, which would tell us that indeed we are getting slightly better. But you need to kind of go back in time, if you will, and take a look at what happened circa 2002, around the time of Farring's uh, article. If you look at the why total knee arthroplasties were failing, uh, polyethylene wear, loosening, and instability accounted for the vast majority as a representative, vast majority of the long-term failure, whereas infection was uh, the uh, number one reason for short-term or early uh, failure. Fast forward 10 years, same group in, at, uh, at Rothman, Peter Sharkey, and what you find there has been a dramatic shift in that time, largely because of advancements in polyethylene kinematics, design locking mechanisms has shifted to where we're now looking at loosening as the primary long-term uh, uh, failure mechanism for total knee arthroplasty. <laughs> this was the first registry data that really started to begin to highlight uh, the positive slope of the loosening line. This is from the Australian Journal of 2014. And we saw this, but out past 10 years, uh, most of the other uh, uh, lines of infection, patellofemoral pain, uh, pain and instability are relatively flat but the slope for loosening has continued to increase. In fact, in the UK, all class data distribution, reasons for infection past uh, loosening is the second most common for revision after infection during the first year and the most common uh, after year one. Also in our uh, more recent data, this is uh, AJRR in 2020, looking at, uh, at uh, eight year uh, data, nearly a quarter of all failures are due uh, to loosening. Aseptic uh, tibial failure predominates, so most of these loosenings that happen in total knee replacement are actually occurring on the tibial side. And I suggest to you that uh, a, a tibial aseptic failure is indeed a, a class problem. It's, and it, it, uh, there's, with this marked reduction in wear-related failures uh, serves to highlight fixation as one of our next unifying uh, goals in total knee arthroplasty. Additionally, it's, it, it's drawn renewed scrutiny of our surgical technique um, and our influencing factors on fixation. But the landscape for a fixation totally arthroplasty is shifting. Uh, there's been much increased in, uh, attention uh, to cementless fixation with some improvement in designs, as well as uh, some long-term studies that have suggested uh, excellent long-term fixation. Um, beyond uh, uh, once uh, beyond uh, the first one to two years. <coughs> In 2022, cemented total knee arthroplasty registry data supports its continued use uh, in total knee. And as a consensus on superiority uh, uh, for long-term fixation, cemented or cementless, there's not, uh, there is not a consensus for one uh, supported over the other. But that may be changing. Uh, this also from AJRR, 2012 to 2019, if you look at patients greater than 65 years of age, cementless fixation is performing slightly uh, better than cemented or hybrid fixation, but the error bars uh, still cross there. And while uh, we are enthusiastic about some of that early data, 
What's particularly worrisome uh, for, uh, for many of us is the fact that uh, between 2017 and 2020, you've seen a 350% increase in the uptake of cementless uh, total knee arthroplasty across the United States. And if you take that and look over the same time frame, uh, nearly a million more cumulative, uh, uh, cumulative uh, procedure volume in that same time frame, if we're wrong, uh, then uh, the, the, the downstream consequence from that uh, decision may be uh, profound. And I will tell you, although uh, cementless fixation yields excellent uh, fixation, cementless fixation uh, can fail on the tibia, as well as cemented fixation uh, can fail on the femur. There's been a great deal of research that's looked at tibial component loosening, and most of that is focused on uh, cement type, mixing, application techniques, bone preparation, how you dry the bone, et cetera, and the cement thickness. <coughs> but why do cemented components loosening persist? And this is, I think, where anecdotal information can be quite helpful. I was in a lab uh, in the design phase of the Atun uh, total knee arthroplasty in, in probably 2012. We were asked to look at a number of different um, uh, materials that we might use uh, for trials in, in total knee arthroplasty. We were looking at different plastics, some of which were clear plastics. As we ended up cementing those in, I was in a lab with uh, Mark Pagnano. Now, uh, we at the end of that, we were asked to cement them in as we did. I looked and was astounded to see this lipid that came up between the cement uh, and the, and, and the uh, tibial base tray that we were cementing in place. And I kind of filed that information away. The next year, uh, there was a study that came out uh, of Mayo, a good group of surgeons, uh, looking at aseptic tibial debonding. Well, that wasn't new in itself, but if you look deeper into the article and kind of look at what was uh, within that article, was this, uh, this instance in which they looked at, at the surgeons. And what, they, what, they, uh, what you could see there is there was a six-fold difference between surgeon three and surgeon seven with the same volume of total knees that were done, indicating, at least to me, that there was likely a component of surgeon and execution that may lead to some variance in terms of these outcomes. The same, uh, the next, next year, I believe, um, uh, uh, Tom Smallsreed and, and Billy in the lab looked at factors of tibial tray bonding strength and, uh, and the influence of lipid contamination. First paper to actually look at this, uh, this topic. And what they found is that you've, if you did indeed have lipid contamination of the uh, tibial base tray, it markedly reduced the fixation strength to the bone below it. With that, um, I uh, summoned uh, some research uh, funds from Depew, uh, we went to, uh, we, we struck a, a few hypotheses uh, and with uh, Tom Faring and some others, we went to Denver University. We postulated, we hypothesized that cementation techniques have evolved from sequential to simultaneous and, and, our, and we theorized that motion that occurred during simultaneous uh, component fixation may have adverse effects on tibial fixation. So we asked four basic research questions. Does knee motion during cementation process change tibial fixation strength? Does knee motion influence uh, marrow-lipid contamination of the implant cement interface? Does the marrow-lipid contamination change implant uh, fixation strength? And does the type of tibial bone prep change uh, tibial fixation strength when knee motion occurs during cementation? As methods, we had 36 lower extremity pelvis to toe, uh, cadaver, 72 knees. We matched those into two different cohorts, <clears throat> one in which on one side, the motion, uh, the tibial implant was cemented into place and held motionless. That was the no motion side. And on the other side, at seven minutes, the knee was brought into, taken through flexion and extension and a gentle varus valgus stress was applied. And, and that was the uh, motion subset, uh, uh, simulating what many surgeons do uh, during uh, their, uh, their total knee arthroplasties. Prior to testing, we took a look at the, uh, at the space between the tibial base tray uh, and the bone preparation, as well as between the bone prep uh, and the uh, bone prep and the uh, prepared uh, cancellous bone surface. And those in which the central fixation fe feature was in direct contact with the surrounding cancellous bone those were referred to as, uh, as no clearance, whereas those in which there was a 
a, 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 a um, mantle of uh, created around the uh, tib uh, central tibial uh, fixation feature, those were clearance prep. Those were intentional uh, in the instrumentation from a number of manufacturers because it was felt from uh, learnings on the hip side that a mantle of cement around uh, the implant may indeed be, uh, be advantageous. We, <clears throat> each specimen was randomly assigned to receive one of nine different uh, uh, contemporary posterior stabilized totally arthroplasty designs, uh, one motion cohort, one non-motion cohort. To answer question one, does knee motion during cementation process affect tibial tray fixation strength? The answer was a strong yes. By nearly uh, one third, the motion that occurred during that cementation process uh, in, uh, impacted the uh, overall pullout strength uh, by Enstrom. Does the knee motion influence merolipid contamination of the cement uh, implant uh, interface? And again, the answer here was yes. On the no motion side, 58% uh, of the surfaces were contaminated by lipid, whereas on the motion, 81%, and that was statistically significant. Every one of these tibial trays that were pulled off, uh, no matter uh, the type, had some degree of lipid contamination. The third question, does the marrow lipid contamination affect implant uh, fixation strength? Again, here, yes, a low negative correlation was observed between the amount of surface contamination and the resultant retention force across all the specimens. And finally, <clears throat> Uh, does the uh, type of tibial bone prep affect tibial fixation strength when knee motion occurs during cementation? And here, uh, the answer uh, is, uh, is also uh, yes. Motion occurring, uh, particularly in the clearance prep, strongly affected uh, the uh, a reduction in, in fixation strength. So in other words, that, that, that extra movement that was allowed by the preparation into the cancellous bone was allowing that tibial uh, base tray to move uh, and hence uh, dis uh, disseminate lipids. In an internal study uh, that was done looking at the tune system uh, was standard in uh, what was referred to as line to line, standard being the over preparation, line to line being a, a uh, more intimate fix. Uh, again, uh, this correlation uh, stood out. So the pullout uh, strength uh, across all different uh, of the nine uh, different preparations uh, degraded with motion compared to non-motion, and the mantle preparation also had profound effects. So let's see if I can get this to run. <clears throat> so this is uh, basically uh, in the lab, um, applying uh, high viscosity cement in this uh, circumstance, and watch what happens through the pinholes below. You can see the lipid that uh, comes pouring out there. Uh, uh, pressure is held there on the motion side. Uh, the knee was brought into extension. Uh, and uh, at, uh, it, it was held motionless for seven minutes and then into extension at, uh, at minute seven and then a very light uh, uh, varus valgus stress. We went back and manufactured for each of the different uh, companies um, these clear um, SLAs of, uh, of the uh, implant and cemented them in and filmed actually what was happening. With any type of force that occurred uh, medial to lateral, any type of rocking anterior to posterior, you saw the matter of the manufacturer, you saw uh, this lipid that was initially not there become evident and you started to see this, uh, this essentially debonding effect that was occurring. The more that you pushed on it, obviously the more of that uh, uh, fluid wave you can imagine. Uh, think in terms of taking a, a pane of uh, glass and putting a single drop of water under it and put it on top of a flat uh, table and move it on, push it on any side of it, it's gonna move that liquid around. Always what's happening there is it's decreasing that bonding strength uh, between the implant uh, and the cement. So um, because we had not standardized, um, uh, the reviewers didn't like uh, where we were uh, with that work. We had not standardized uh, the bone density. Uh, we had uh, not standardized the tibial prep. Uh, we went back and uh, re uh, did the study. I actually went up to uh, Brown University uh, and did the study there. Uh, and this was recently presented at uh, AAOS uh, and it was the uh, Random Award Papers published this month uh, with the help of Ryan Martin, uh, Tom Faring. Uh, and what we did was essentially ask three slightly different uh, questions. Does, uh, does motion during cementation uh, decrease initial implant uh, fixation strength? Uh, do, do the implants have similar pullout strength? 
is the interface of failure associated with implant pullout strength. We had 40 cadaveric um, specimens, uh, 80 knees, torso to uh, toe specimens, five implant manufacturers, all of which are contemporary designs. This accounts for the vast majority of total knees that are performed in the United States. We blinded, uh, blinded them um, to, uh, to the manufacturer and they randomized to a single implant manufacturer to each specimen and then randomized one side to motion and the other side to the no motion. Again, uh, one side was held uh, with axial compression until cement cured on the no motion side. And on the motion side, uh, axial compression was maintained until seven minutes. And then the knee was uh, uh, taken through uh, flexion, extension, uh, and a very uh, light uh, varus valgus stress. The specimens were then uh, prepared and placed in an instrum. We did pull out testing and a backside uh, of each tray was analyzed looking for the uh, location of failure and the amount of lipid that was there. Implant E, uh, we had some difficulty in attachment of the instrum to it. We were able to pull off eight uh, samples uh, and had to, uh, and broke the fixation fe uh, feature. We had to come back three weeks later. We saw a widely disparate uh, um, uh, performance from uh, after freezing the specimens and removed uh, those uh, uh, implant E from analysis. The entire mean uh, cohort strength was nearly 5,000 newtons. And there was a, a statistically significant difference between motion, uh, no motion and motion with no motion actually uh, being superior. And between implants, a significant difference between the uh, mean pullout strength of implant A, B, C, and D, um, and particularly uh, statistically significant, uh, highly statistically significant between A and uh, implant D. We did a, a we did a uh, visual assessment of these as well and found uh, three different failure modes, uh, implant cement interface in which it was uh, pulled uh, and debonded essentially, those in which uh, the cement was still well bound uh, to uh, the, uh, the implant and it failed at the bone interface and then a mixed uh, failure pattern. Uh, the, uh, not surprisingly, the uh, implant cement interface failed at a significantly lower pullout strength and, and again, um, as we looked at the uh, degree of lipid contamination, the amount of lipid contamination of the uh, tibial implant correlated uh, with a negatively correlated with a lower pullout strength uh, for implants A and D. So, and discussion, does motion during cementation decrease initial tibial fixation strength? Once again, uh, the answer is yes. And our conclusion there uh, was that we should limit or eliminate motion during the curing phase of cement uh, for our tibias. Second, uh, do all implants have a similar initial pullout strength? And again, here the answer is no. There are aspects of, uh, of design and back surface <coughs> components of each of these implants that, uh, that leads to a significant uh, variance in terms of their fixation strength. There's a 2x uh, increase in fixation between implant uh, A and D with no motion and that's multiplied uh, with motion. So significant differences of pullout strength uh, presented uh, can be magnified indeed with motion. Is there an interface failure associated uh, with uh, implant pullout strength? And again, yes. Implants and techniques that are more resistant to lipid contamination can potentially improve implant uh, fixation strength. So I'd ask then why is any motion too much motion? If you're very careful about how you do your total knee arthroplasty, now, why would any motion still be uh, a potential problem? And the answer here is, as you take an E through motion, there's movement of the contact forces. There's never equal forces between the medial and lateral side. And as you go from flexion to extension, you're moving uh, that force across the top of the tibial tray. So invariably, uh, there is motion that's occurred. Now, the, the magnitude of that motion may be small, but it doesn't take much in order to disseminate uh, the lipid. And how do we come to accept motion in the first place? When we first started doing total knee arthroplasties, essentially every implant was cemented one at a time. Uh, these cases took three to four hours and the pressure on time uh, led to, uh, to more and more patients, uh, more and more surgeons uh, cementing implants at the same time. This is 1996, a survey in England, uh, a, a quarter of the, uh, a third of the patients at that time had one component cemented at a time and 65% uh, both components uh, cemented. 
So I'd say if motion dissipates uh, lipid and lipid reduces implant fixation bond strength, it leads to asking where indeed uh, is the weak link. The weak link, uh, as that data would suggest, is between the implant and the, and the cement. Then if we uh, looked at that, we might be able to, uh, to, uh, to get to some better conclusions. This is another study we did here, uh, led by Ryan Martin, 149 patients with isolated aseptic uh, uh, tibial loosenings, review reviewed the radiographs and offered reports, and looked at uh, the location of the failure, whether it was the implant cement or the cement bone interface. The demographics in the groups uh, were uh, relatively similar, but what we found was that 94% of the patients failed at the implant cement interface. Uh, and so a surprisingly large percentage of those uh, uh, failed as we uh, might have predicted from the lab. 64% of those failed with varus collapse. And I would suggest to you that that is indeed a, a, a time uh, phenomenon. Uh, and only 6% of the patients failed at the cement bone interface. So what we recommend from that, uh, again, uh, improving fixation <coughs> and implant cement interface to decreased uh, tibial loosening. There's been a fair amount of, uh, of, of work, again, done on cement mantle thickness, uh, suggesting uh, both from uh, this paper and, and others from the lab uh, that three to five millimeters uh, of fixation uh, of uh, penetration into the cancellous bone is ideal uh, for to avoid heat, um, uh, thermal necrosis of the bone, but also to give it the mechanical characteristics. And this uh, paper looked at uh, high viscosity versus low viscosity and penetration in a doughy phase of cement. So what we challenged that uh, and said, okay, well, if that's the case, then maybe that uh, is what we should be able to see in our tibial fixation database. We went back and looked at 216 patients revised for aseptic tibial failure, looked at their, their radiographs and the knee uh, society scoring of the, of the zones. Uh, patient demographics, again, basically the same, but what we found was not uh, was uh, was not uh, for us terribly surprising, but <coughs> of of these failures, um, uh, the average cement mantle thickness across the zones was indeed well within this recommended zone, recommended range. If you broke that out according to where they actually failed at the implant cement interface or the bone cement interface. Uh, the, those in the bone cement interface actually failed with thinner cement. So it may indeed suggest that you need uh, that, that fair amount of uh, that three to five millimeters of cancellous uh, bone penetration, but you still need to pay attention to uh, the interface of fixation between the tibial implant uh, and, the, and the cement. So again, recommend, recommending optimizing uh, that cement fixation to the implant. So this is a kind of a, an old uh, current uh, technique. Some of you have uh, watched this. If you see, I'll place the uh, cement down into the uh, center aspect of the, uh, of the tibia. And watch what happens when I push my finger in there. You can see the lipid that comes up. We want to take a time to remove that lipid and then uh, distribute the cement over the top of the, uh, uh, of the surface uh, of the tibia. As you put a tibial implant down onto uh, the implant, uh, the compressive forces dissipate uh, exponentially as you get to the edge. So you wanna take some time and actually press the cement uh, down into the cancellous bone of the surface. To try to eliminate the contamination, we do what we now call double butter. We put it on both sides. Uh, we do that now earlier in the process than is demonstrated in this video and hold pressure there until uh, we're seeing complete uh, cement consolidation. Once we see the cement that is com uh, completely hard on one side, staggering uh, the mixing of the cement, we'll move on to the, uh, to the femur. <coughs> Uh-oh. Always a new failure.
see? Yeah. All right, very good. So again, in conclusion, with greater than 70, uh, greater than 95% success for total knee arthroplasty at 10 years, and a myriad of failure mechanisms and influences, and a signal <laughs> size for aseptic uh, loosening of one to 3% uh, per year, it takes us a long time to recognize our or surgeon's influence on this, uh, on this failure cycle. So in conclusion, I think our optics are much better. Cementless designs are gonna to continue to gain momentum, but we have much to learn still with regarding patient selection, fixation interfaces, bone preparation, kinematic influences. Cemented total knee arthroplasties are gonna remain with us as a fixation technique for the foreseeable future. Motion and design influence the interface of greatest concern. That is the cement implant interface, likely due to the influence of merolipid contamination and should be a focus of our future research design and technique uh, efforts. It's time to re-examine the myth that cementing all components at one time in total knee arthroplasty is without consequence. It's time to reconsider the adductive heuristic that have clouded our understanding of tibial component aseptic failure. The role of lipids has been hidden in plain sight. Thank you. interesting and uh, you know we just did a tumor related knee yesterday so it's all kind of these the, these concepts are all very fresh in my mind so the one thing that you didn't talk about and i'm wondering how you guys think about that as well i know there's been a move towards uh less use of tourniquets so obviously you know some of the lipid is from the bone itself but it's marrow elements so does is there a way to evaluate the role of tourniquet use Yes or no. Obviously, in a cadaver model, it's a bit tough to do. And secondly, the thing I do to visually think I have the uh, tibia well prepared is use of a pulse vac. So, wondering about those two things and how those play into your thinking on this con these concepts. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, in contrast to this research, uh, the way that uh, that uh, tourniquet or tourniquet-less total knee arthroplasty has been have been studied to date is based on the degree of bone penetration into the cement, which our study of failures, a retrospective study, would clearly indicate that's not the right metric to be able to study that uh, influence. There's a study that came out uh, this past uh, year in 2021 uh, that looked at uh, as an RSA-based study uh, and looked at, uh, at, the, at, at micromotion and testing following initial fixation. And in that study, uh, those that, that had a very slight degree of micromotion, i.e. the ones that were potentially uh, close to debonding or partially debonded, had the lower pull-off uh, strength uh, when tested. And that, again, is a is lab, maybe a little bit better way of testing uh, into that theory of whether uh, tourniquet is going to be uh, impactful or not. I would suggest to you that unless you can keep it dry so that when you put that tibial implant down, femoral implant on, you're not seeing any expression of, of fluid. Uh, because there's a component in, in marrow uh, uh, fluids, there's a component of lipid regardless. It's a, it's a mixed uh, fluid there. That unless you can see it completely dry, uh, you're, you're not uh, likely uh, offsetting uh, that influence. There have been a number of, uh, of centers that have tried suction into the, into the tibia or into the femur. We tried that on the, on, the, on the femoral side to reduce some of that uh, uh, pressure, upwelling, if you will, of, the, uh, of those uh, fluids. Maybe that would be beneficial. Um, the CO2 uh, guns that uh, splatter everything all over, put a mist into the air, dry it out pretty well and get rid of most of that and probably pretty good, but you get a fair amount of over penetration of cement in those circumstances. Definitely pull slavage, definitely preparing the bone, definitely trying to keep it uh, uh, segmentally uh, cementing so that you're trying to <coughs> decrease the amount of that uh, uh, that actually bubbles up when you, when you cement down into it. A fan, fantastic um, body of work that you guys have done here, and it's why you guys are the leading joint program in the country. Um, one of the questions that I would have that would expand on what Josh was saying is, why have we not thought if lipid contamination is a big deal? And I would think it would be a big deal for porous coated as well, because um, lipid can't be good for that either. What about a temporary lipid binding agent that would allow you on a Actually, uh, there have been some acids uh, that have been, uh, you know, acid will help dissipate some of the lipid. There have been some acids that have been applied uh, to the tibial surface. Again, from um, 
you know, the, from a, uh, a cellular uh, perspective, you're worried about death. You, you don't want to discourage the death of the of the cancellous uh, bone that's the li living cancellous bone that's there. When you see that actually happening from therm thermal necrosis, you'll actually see a radiolucent line that'll occur early within that first year afterwards. And then uh, uh, it stays often steady uh, for many years thereafter. But uh, I think that's the, the primary reason why we, we haven't looked at that. There, there's still other questions that we need to answer. We've got, uh, we've got another study that we're getting ready to do, looking at, uh, in this case, implant A and implant D, uh, the best performing and the worst performing, to try to tease out if there's a difference that we can ascertain between the pull-off strength if we uh, change the cement fixation uh, application where we apply it early uh, on the, onto the uh, back of the tibial tray uh, or not apply it at all, uh, just as, as most people end up doing and, and putting it in. So the single butter versus double butter technique and looking at the two different uh, uh, implants from sort of both ends of the spectrum to see if we can, uh, can, can tease out a difference there. Hey, well, what's the current technique for making the tibial cuts and do you instrument all the way down to the canal? Because I would think if the, if the canal is entered and that would introduce a lot more lipids to the cut surface. Yeah, the fixation, uh, there have been a handful of different designs uh, with fixation just to the surface. And mostly, most of those um, have not fared as well uh, in the long, uh, in long term follow up studies. So most designs now uh, instrument down into the, into the metaphysis of the tibia. Um, so I, I'm not sure that uh, we're going to, we're going to be able to get away but potentially in cementless designs. The, the problem with cementless designs is that once again, you're trying to maintain contact, uh, steady contact uh, without uh, the rocking and the micro motion that can occur. So um, for the foreseeable future, you're gonna see designs that are intimately in contact with the cancellous bone and the metaphysis uh, with some type of keel feature. And those, those features, um, uh, are uh, the the the, the, the uh, lab-based uh, uh, retrievals on those uh, are better if the keel is indeed cemented. Hey, uh, th thanks for your talk. One of the issues we struggle with from a registry perspective, and we've had conversations with folks in England and Australia, is this concept of camouflage, and this is especially true within hip and knee and any implants, which is Within a given system, there's multiple combinations, right? Different tibial base plates, femoral, PSCR, polyethylene, things along those lines. And we tend to, at least at the registry level, study them as a class. And sometimes if there's failure rates within a particular subsection of that class, it's camouflaged by the, by the bigger picture of the overall performance no of doubt. the class in general. And then you add in, I think, what you very well described here is the element of surgical technique. And we all know that implant companies, as soon as there's a, a signal for failure, the first thing they do is run and blame the surgeons historically. So the thing that we struggle with is how do you tease out this issue of camouflage and big, you know, registry data? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. Uh, I think that's an ongoing um, issue with registry. I don't think we're ever going to be able to get away from that. Uh, you know, in, in, in the in the tibial in the uh, attune fixation story um, was just indeed some of that. You saw a, a early experience uh, with that design in which uh, large groups of, of surgeons were having excellent results with it, and, you, and then you'd see these uh, groups of surgeons that would have, you know, these you know three to five percent failure rate, uh, which is you know disturbingly high, and <clears throat> that uh, spurred a lot of why I did some of this uh, research. And I think it, uh, it clearly um, leads to technique, our technique, uh, as one of the reasons that limits uh, the, uh, the, the ability of an implant to do well. Of, um, you know, of the implants uh, that are here now, only implant D uh, in this particular series does not have an intimate contact to the cancellous bone. Those that have a very uh, keel style uh, implant uh, tibial tray reduce that anterior to posterior motion, likely impacting uh, their survivorship. So I, I think you're, you're gonna see regardless uh, that camouflage uh, that's gonna occur. The S plus and the attune system uh, has been performing uh, 
extremely well, but what's, uh, what's, uh, what you're still looking at in the overall uh, registry is the combination of old and new uh, that are still reported as, as a single one in the class. And so that, that mixing or averaging, if you will, fails to average good surgeons and bad surgeons. You know, I think what you, uh, you, you can potentially look at is volume-based uh, experience, but sometimes volume uh, leads to uh, the, the speed that leads to these type of issues. So it's a, it, it's, it, it's a complicated problem. Great talk, Dr. Mason. I just had a question that was kind of <clears throat> along similar lines to Dr. Hammond. Do you think that there's going to be any role in the future for kind of a hybrid tibial fixation from a submitless standpoint? You know, I've seen sometimes people will do a submitted tibia or a submitless tibia, but put a, a layer of cement just over the, the base plate over the top of the tibia, but not, you know, pressurize into where the keel goes. Um, do you think that there's any role for that for preventing the lipid, you know, kind of emulsification up through and, and you get immediate fixation with that? And then long-term fixation, you know, body on growth through your through your stem. Yeah, I think uh, it uh, when the Zimmer uh, uh, tibial tray, the uh, TM tibial tray, first came out, uh, one of the centers that studied it uh, uh, prospectively was Mayo, and one of the arms of that study was actually one where they surface cemented with the pegs that went down in there and their highest end growth uh, into those pegs occurred in the ones in which they had surface cemented. They don't make that recommendation currently uh, for that particular design, but I think people are going to experiment with that. We've, uh, we've, we've done that uh, with this mixed fixation uh, in, in total uh, hips and now revision total knees. Uh, well, we have the biologic uh, sleeves and cones that we'll use for the metaphyseal fixation yeah, we'll put a cemented stem back behind it to get that initial stability to allow the, bi uh, the biologic fixation. Where we end up with that in the future, I think, is, uh, is going to be difficult to understand. Again, the point uh, of uh, some of the first part of this talk is that we don't have the, the, the ability to sort of see the consequence uh, of, <coughs> of our actions for at least 10 years into the future, five to 10 years into the future. It's really hard to make a scientifically sound decision uh, when that's indeed the case. Yes, sir. Where do you think all poly tibial components fit into all of this? They're compromises with all poly uh, tibial components. I think, uh, and, and, and there their strengths there. Uh, registry data would support their continued use, uh, certainly. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the fixation that, uh, that uh, will occur, the, the lack of modularity, the lack of backside wear, um, <clears throat> the lower cost, uh, all of those are things that, uh, that tend to uh, favor that. But because inventory costs, if uh, you can imagine the various combinations that occur, the conformity uh, that is on the top of the tibial, uh, top of the tibial tray, an all polytibial tray, has to match the conformity of the femur. Um, if you can find that uh, to you know, a, a 8, 10, 12, 14 tibial base tray, and then for a size, you know, two, three, four, five, uh, that it might fit with on the on the femoral side, then you multiply the number of SKUs that you have to do, and it becomes unmanageable from an inventory perspective. So uh, what happens there is a compromise, which may be okay, and with current modular, uh, current uh, polyethylene, of uh, a reduction in the conformity may lead to a little bit more instability, may lead to some other issues. So there's there there's a, there's definitely a, 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 a second side of that balance. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.